And the reason why I believe in Santa Claus is even in this really difficult year of COVID, uh, he still came to our house in Charlotte, right by the Arboretum. He came down, got real slim down the chimney, and he brought my six and my eight-year-old a very special present. And he brought this little karaoke microphone. Has anybody ever seen one of these? Okay, we got a couple in the room. And the best part about these karaoke microphones is it'll play any song that your little heart desires, and you can sing right along with it. So what it does is, like, just like this, I'm going to start with my favorite song. It's a Garth Brooks song called Standing Outside the Fire. And, here, and here's how Garth Brooks sings it. Call them blue, those stars to stand, those stars to show, the ones that never do let go. When the tables be in turn. Not bad, John. A round of applause for this voice I've got. But what's fantastic about this little this little microphone? Who, who's next? I want to. We got karaoke time. I got a whole forty-five minutes to cover. Who's up? Can I get a no? But beautiful about this is my six and eight-year-old love it. And we had my brother and sister-in-law over for dinner not long ago. And after dinner, this mic found its way to the living room. And my little six-year-old said, Daddy, 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 play my favorite song. She gets up there first. And I said, I knew exactly what it was. And she said, and she said uh, Daddy, Daddy, can you please play Shut Up and Dance? Shut Up and Dance. This is the first time this song's ever been played in this church. Just keep your eyes on me. I said you're holding back. She said, shut up and dance with me this morning. And so this whole time, this little six-year-old's up there in front of this whole room of adults and her cousins, and she's just, she's kind of whispering it. I've heard her sing it a lot louder before, but she was hitting the chorus. She was hitting the chorus. And my niece says, I'm next, I'm next. She says, Uncle John, Uncle John, play my favorite song. I said, well, tell me what it is. I got, I got it right at my fingertips. And she says, play the middle by Zed. Take a seat. I can't Zed. sing this one. On the okay. I can't Stay sing leave. this one. The but the whole time this little nine-year-old is singing this song, she's looking around the room. She's really cautious. She's singing, but she's not really singing. She's, she's worried what everybody else is thinking in the room. But she got through the whole song. We gave her a round of applause. Everybody was excited. And then my little four-year-old niece says, Uncle John, Uncle John, play my favorite song. I said, I know what your favorite song is. You sing it all the time. And it's Into the Unknown, Frozen 2. And this little four-year-old nailed this song like nothing I've ever seen in my life. She gets to the chorus, her eyes are closed, and she is just singing with everything she's got. It was beautiful. It was absolutely magnificent. And we gave her a big round of applause at the end. But she's the only one in the room that sang it the entire song with everything that she had. And as she was singing that song, I looked around the room at the adults. There was four adults in the room. And every single one of us was singing with her. None of us had the courage to get up on the mic and sing in front of everybody else like I just did with you guys today. But it it taught me a really important lesson. Everybody wants to sing their song, but so few of us actually do it. And we're here in this church today, and I think when we relate that to Christ... So many of us want to be like Christ, but so few few of us actually do it over the course of our entire lives. We want, we're here today, we want to be more like Christ, but we don't. We don't. And I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to tell a story, but it's not my story. But I think it's an important story for us all to hear. There was a a Chinese man, he was a, a a Christian, he was a Catholic, he was a husband, he was a father. But he lived in, a, in an area of China and the communist government where they didn't like you to go to church and they wanted to root out Catholicism altogether. 
And so each week he would take his family to an underground church in somebody's house with a, a priest that would come from out of town just to say mass. It was, a, it, was, it was risky, very risky, but he believed in it that much. One week, he was discovered that he was attending this underground church. And he was taken hostage and he was put in a jail by the captives. And they hung him against the wall. He was naked. They poured water on him. He was cold. All in an effort to get him to tell them who the priest was. Because if they rooted out the priest, there could be no longer have mass in that region. But this man didn't want to give it up. He didn't want to give up the man's name. Because if he gave up the man's name, his family wouldn't be able to go to church. His, his friends and his community, they wouldn't be able to go to church. So every day, they would pull him off that wall and they would put water on him. They'd put an electric cattle prod on him. And at the end of that torture session, they said, who is the priest? And after every session, he would say, I'm not telling. Imagine for a second. You getting an electric cattle prod to tell you who Father Richard is or whoever your pastor is. You'd tell him in an instant. That's what I, but not this man. Eventually they figured out that this man was not going to be broken and they, they let him go. A couple years later, he and his family escaped to the United States. And he got there and he couldn't believe that he could go to Mass every single day in freedom. Took his family to daily Mass every single day. But it didn't take long for him to figure out that I've got to provide for my family and so I've got to go to work. So what did this man do? He said, well, I'll, I'll give up the daily mass, and I'll go to work. I'll get there early. I'll make more money. So he gave up the daily mass, and he would just go on the weekends. But he lives in America now, and he knows that we're in this, uh, this society where if you just work a little bit harder and you try new things, you can make more money and provide better for your family. So he says, you know what? I'm going to start doing that on the weekends. I'll just pick up an extra shift or two. Pretty soon, this man... Stop going to Mass on weekends. Now keep in mind, this is the same man that got an electric cattle prod put on his skin to, to name the name of a priest, and he said no. He would go on Easter. He would go on Christmas. And then eventually, he just stopped going altogether. Now here's this man that he came to America and in an instant, no one even had to pry that faith out of him. It just automatically vanished. No one had to even do anything other than the fact that he was unaware of what was happening. And he got really comfortable. And he liked his life. And he was able to provide better for his family. But he lost his faith. Now it would be easy to think that that's only for that man who came from China to America. But that wouldn't be true, would it? Each and every single one of us is susceptible to losing our faith. We're men. We sin. We're human. Just like that man. So why do we? Why do we, why do we want to be more like Jesus but we don't end up being like Jesus on an ongoing basis. Why are those things that might happen in our lives that cause that to happen? The first realization is this. We are sinners and we are not a savior. We are, we are weak men. There's only been one Jesus Christ to walk this earth. And we're not it. Even if we think we are sometimes. We're sinners. We're weak. The second reason that we, we, we miss it more than ever is because we, we focus more on the immediacy versus the long term. 
We focus more on what's right here in front of us that we can feel or see or, or make us feel better in the short term versus what's right for us or our families in the long term. I mean, I, I, every time I think of this, I think of the weakness or the sin of the flesh that we're all susceptible to. And it's so much easier to say, this feels good in this moment, let's do this, versus what, how we're actually becoming as men and what we're becoming as men because of that sin. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of these things where these happen to all of us and we're susceptible to all of us. The other reason, I think, is we compare ourselves to others instead of comparing ourselves to the best version of ourselves. We live in this society today, culturally, where it's like, keep up with the Joneses. He got a new car. He got a new house. He got a new job. He's got this many followers. He got he shit this video on TikTok. And all of a sudden, we're comparing our lives to somebody else's versus us just becoming the very best version we can be. C.S. Lewis said, comparison is the thief of joy. Now we're all, look, guilty as charged. It's, it, this is easy to do. Which is why so many fall of us fall into not becoming like Christ. Now, I know we've painted kind of an ugly picture here in some ways, and it's not all bad. I've learned some things over my years about what, how do we become more like Christ, and it's something that I call follow the hidden staircase. Follow the hidden staircase. We want to be more like Christ. I have a six and an eight-year-old, and they love to play this game on the Switch called Mario Kart's Nintendo, Nintendo game. And when we first got the game, I would just destroy them. I mean, they could not keep up with my little car. But as they started playing a lot more than me, I would play them and they would start beating me. And I'm like, this isn't right. I'm better at video games than an eight-year-old. <laughs> I was wrong. But I did something one day. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go up and I'm going to watch you guys play that game. Because they're doing something that I'm not doing. I mean, I got quick fingers. And I watched them, and, and they would go down these routes, and all of a sudden, they would veer right, and they would get on the hidden path. They knew these shortcuts and all the boards that I didn't know about. And when I'm racing and I'm focused on my own board, my own screen, I don't see them taking these shortcuts. So I started taking some notes. I started knowing the boards we were playing and where they were taking the shortcuts, and pretty soon, I was keeping up with them again. But sometimes I would actually know where the shortcut was and I would still miss it. I would know exactly where it was and I'd still miss it. And what we're going to do today is I'm going to share with you these three rungs of the, the hidden staircase to help you be more like Christ. But just because you know them, we're going to take care of the knowing part today. But just because you know them doesn't mean it's going to be easy. In fact, it could be really hard to do these things that I'm going to talk about. But there's only three. So we should, we should be able to do, get, them, get them pretty good. So the first part of the, of the hidden staircase is to sacrifice yourself. Sacrifice yourself. Now when John introduced me, a little background I went to Charlotte Catholic, and then I went to the University of Maryland on a golf scholarship. And I always was pretty good at the game, held my own, finished, finished school, turned professional, played three years of professional golf. And I was about the most selfish man in all of easily Mecklenburg County, but probably much further than that. And I, I, I grew up in the church, but I really didn't know Christ. And my best friend at the time uh, had left the Catholic Church to go be an evangelical. And he would always challenge me. We had this very challenging relationship. And he would challenge me on teachings of the church. 
and why I was Catholic. And I would give these absolute hokey answers. And he knew it and I knew it. And I didn't like it. And one year I was still playing golf. I was out in California. I was in Coronado Beach. Beautiful place to play golf. And I was playing terrible. I was hitting it both. Have we golfers in the room? Okay, I was hitting it both ways, and that is a bad place to be when you're an amateur golfer. It's a really bad place to be when you're a professional golfer. So I was really struggling. And when I would struggle, I would turn to sin. When I would shoot a bad score on the golf course, I would finish, and I would go right to my darkest places, and I would go to sin. And guess what's in California? Casinos. Specifically, poker rooms. So I would have these bad rounds of golf. I was out there battling it by myself. And then I would go to these poker rooms and I would stay for as long as I, as I could make it. And one day I played a really bad round of golf. And I'd had a really bad day on the poker table. And I was in a dark, dark place. And I left that casino and I'm in this rental car and I'm driving home and I stop at this red light and I look to my right and there's a Catholic church and to this day I don't know exactly why I turned into it but I have to think it's because my parents took me to mass every week and we were in the front row I think that had something to do with it but I pulled in that church and I walked in and I sat down and I looked up And what's ironic about this is right above my head is what I saw, but it wasn't covered. It was a crucifix. And it was Jesus Christ on the crucifix that I had seen thousands and thousands of times in my life. But it was in that moment that I realized what he had actually done for me. I realized that this man, God, became human and died on the cross for all of our sins, but specifically that day, John eats his sins. Man, I cried like a baby in that church. I, I'm telling you, I have ADD. My wife says I have it immensely. I think it's moderate, but I'm going to go there just for a second. ADD mind. Our Protestant brothers and sisters that now I, I really, I, I have a lot of great friends. That friend that brought me really challenged my faith. We are best friends today as we've ever been. But they don't have Jesus Christ on the cross in their churches. They don't have crucifixes in their churches. And I just want each of you to think about that right now. We look at this thing all the time, whether it be around our necks or whether it be when we walk into our churches, we see it. If that crucifix wasn't there that day, there is no way I would be in front of you today. So the next time you walk in your church or when this purple veil is pulled up, I just want you to say thank you. This man came to earth to pay the ultimate price for your sins. I'd been in the church, the Catholic church, my whole life, and it took a Catholic to leave the church to challenge me on my faith for me to understand what he did on the cross. That's not the way it should be. It should be the men in this room that are willing to challenge someone that isn't living in alignment with the faith when they see it. It shouldn't take someone leaving the church to get me fired up about Christ. And it shouldn't take that for you either. Okay, back to my story. ADD, out, gone, off my soapbox. That night I got, back to the, I got back to the condo I was staying in and my buddy that I'd played college golf with called me that day and he was asking how I played. This is pre-internet like it is now. 
And I told him I, I really was struggling, but I said I had this incredible moment in my life today, and I just have to tell you about it. And he listened. And he's not a believer at the time. He is now, which is amazing. But the weight that left me that day telling him about what Christ did for John Eads and the situation that happened in that church has I've carried forward for 15 years. And what I recognize is that Jesus' Christ's sacrifice now had to become my sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice right there wasn't going to work if John didn't sacrifice himself. Selfish John. Do what I want to do. When I want to do it. How I want to do it. To whom I want to do it with. I had to make changes. And it started with sacrificing myself. So the first rung, the first rung of this ladder is sacrificing yourself. The second rung of the ladder, which, how many people, how many people bring, how many people have a Bible with them today? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, ten, I got a couple back there. I see you. Not, not as many as we should. How many people, by show of hands, no, no judgment here in the least, how many people have the Bible app downloaded on their phone? Okay, we're getting better. Now we're getting there. How many people look at Scripture on a daily basis? Now we are talking. So what we're about to do in each one of these rings, we're going to look at some Scriptures that matter to you and they matter to me about sacrificing yourself. Sacrificing yourself. So if you have your Bible app, open it. If you don't, that's okay. If you, got, if you don't have it, I want you to download it. You don't have to do it right now. But Galatians 2.20. Find Galatians 2.20 in your Bible app. I'm going to read it to you don't, if you don't have it. It's okay. Galatians 2.20 says, I live, yet now it is not I but truly Christ who lives in me. And though I live now in the flesh, I live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and delivered Himself for me. Now we talk about sacrificing yourself. This first line of Galatians 2.20 is all you need to know. I live, yet now it is not I, but truly Christ who lives in me. I mean, can we put ourselves, can we lay ourselves down and say this is no longer about John or about Keith or about Todd or about Michael, but it is about whom? Say it. Yes, yeah, say it. Christ. That's exactly right. Now this is not easy. We'll get, you go to uh, Mark 8.35. Mark 8.35 on, on your Bible app. For whoever will have chosen to save his life will lose it. But whoever will have lost his life for my sake and for the gospel shall save it. <laughs> it's like saying, man, if you want to go to heaven, you got to give it up. If you, if you, if you, want, to, if you want to really lose the gain, you got to lose something. And that's what the word sacrifice means. It means giving something up. That's what the word means. Giving something up. Are you willing to give something up for yourself, for Christ? Now, the second part of this is, is survive the test. So you have, number one, sacrifice yourself. The second rung of this ladder, if you're taking notes, write this down. That is, survive the test. Survive the test. Now the devil, the devil doesn't want you to get close to Christ. Let's be really clear about that. And he's going he's gonna to go right to your weaknesses as a man to make sure you don't get closer to Christ. Because he doesn't want warriors for Christ. Why would the devil want warriors for Christ? He wants more people living in sin. He wants more people further from heaven than, than with it. 
He's going to attack it. I, had, I have two healthy ch- children, eight and six. And after the second healthy baby, my wife and I have had five consecutive miscarriages. I didn't know a thing about miscarriage. Even after the first one, I made every mistake under the sun as a husband. Act like it was no big deal. By the time we got to the fifth one, I didn't know if my wife was going to get out of bed. And you know what happens when we're about to have real talk. Can we have real talk for a second? When your wife can't get out of bed and she's, and she's depressed at life and struggling, guess what she definitely doesn't want to do? She definitely doesn't want to sleep with you. She wants to know part of you. And so where, does, where is the devil going to attack John in that moment when, when, when you and your wife are not together? Where is he going to attack it? That's exactly right. He's going to attack it with the flesh, man. And I've learned something really important. And I want you to write this down. Only leaders who are tested become great. Only leaders who are tested become great. You're not going to get, you're not going to get, become great at anything if you're never tested. That just doesn't make sense. It makes zero sense at all. We are going to be tested by the devil. And we got to be prepared for it. we got to be ready to fight. I, I, I want to read you these two scriptures because I think they're just the best. This is my favorite scripture of all time. I don't even need the notes. Galatians 6, 9. Don't grow weary in doing good. For in due time, you will reap the harvest if you do not give up. Don't grow weary in doing good, for you will reap the harvest if you do not give up. Man, I, man, I don't know who needs that today. I don't know what you're going through. A mentor of mine, the very first interview I ever did, he said this to me, John. He said, everybody's going through something whether you know it or not. Oh, man, is that true. Even people that look like they have it all figured out, they got something going on. You've got something going on. I've got something going on. Don't grow weary in doing good, for in due time you will reap the harvest if you do not give up. I mean, it's just so good. And many of the tests that we've, that we've been given in our life, we don't know how to handle them. And I just want to give you two how-to strategies real quick. The first is to be really ruthless with your environment. Ruthless. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, saying, I'm not talking about that word lightly. If you want to survive the test, you have to be ruthless with your environment. And even while being ruthless, you will still be tested in some ways. And when those tests happen, the best strategy I've ever learned is just to embrace the uncomfortable pause. Let it pass. Don't act immediately. Embrace the uncomfortable pause and let that attack pass. The third ring is to sign up to lead. Sign up to lead. Now, I wrote a book called Building the Best in the Back, and I define leadership this way. Someone whose actions inspire, empower, and serve in order to elevate others. Someone whose actions inspire, empower, and serve in order to elevate others. You don't need a title to do that. Every single man sitting in this room can sign up to inspire, to empower, and to serve in order to elevate others. You don't need a special leadership DNA to do that. The word inspire literally means to breathe life into. To breathe life into. How many times do we, do we forget to breathe life into our kids or to our spouse and we actually tear them down more than anything? How many, how many dads do we have in this room with kids still at home? Okay. 
An interview I did with a guy named Bob Bodine, he taught me this really incredible lesson. He calls it the Father's Blessing, and it's, it's based on an old Jewish tradition. And in the old Jewish tradition, the, the father would lay his hands on his son's head, and he would say, you are going to do great and mighty things. You are going to change the world. I'm going to give everything that I have to you. So how do I inspire my six and eight-year-old? I get down on knee just like this. Now I'm really, all, I'm, my height is really going to be a challenge now. And I do this right here with my two kids. Every single night I put them to bed. And I put those hands on their, on their head and I say, John Ellis, Lucy, you are going to do great and mighty things. You are going to change the world. I'm going to give everything that I have to you. And you know when it, when it starts to hit home is when you forget and you're busy and you got a lot of work going on and you start walking out that door and they said, Daddy, Daddy, what about the Father's blessing? If you want to inspire, if you want to breathe life into your kids or your grandkids or to anybody else, don't be afraid to use those hands. God gave them to you for a reason. We're all priests in some way, scripturally. So, inspire, breathe life into. Empower is to help somebody else make decisions. No longer as a parent or as a, a, a spouse can you make all the decisions. There's too much information. There's too much going on. We've got to empower our people or our kids or our spouse or our family to make decisions where the information is. And lastly, to serve. I and mean, we don't have a better example than the man above me of what great servant leader it looked like. I, I, I love this. It's, uh, it, it's from Matthew 20, 28. Even the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve. To give his life as a redemption for many. Jesus Christ came here not to be served, but to serve. I mean, that's at the center of leadership. Is putting somebody else's needs ahead of your own. And that is really hard to do because if you're going to look at a picture, someone's going to put a picture, a group picture of your family on Facebook, where do your eyes go first? How's John look in this picture? How's that new jacket look? We're wired to think about who first? I, me. So if we're going to serve, if we're going to put other, needs ahead of, other people's needs ahead of our own, it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of work. I'm going to... Corinthians, last scripture of the day for my, for my Bible people. Hopefully you all will be soon. Corinthians 16, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. If you're going to sign up to lead, you're going to have to have courage because it's not going to be easy. It's not easy to go in there and put your hands on your head's kids and they might even laugh at you the first time. But be strong and be courageous. So that's the hidden staircase. Sacrifice yourself, survive the test, and sign up to lead. Will it be easy, men? No, it will not. It'll be really hard. But if days like today... And it's people like you and it's men like you who God has called to do this. Not for the short term, but for the long term. And I'm thrilled each of you have, are here today and you're making the commitment that Bishop talked about earlier. This is the last thing, I promise. This is the last thing. The last thing. I've learned that there's a big difference in being interested and being committed. See, for a while, I really thought I wanted to get into, do we have any hunters in the room? Like deer hunting? Got a couple, I see John, okay. Uh, I really thought I wanted to get into hunting. Got the gear, got the gun, got the license. My buddy took me out to his farm. 3.30 a.m., we got in the car, in the, in the deer stand by five. Never saw a deer, never shot the gun, never been hunting again, <laughs> okay. I was simply interested in deer hunting. You could say, John, I'm going to give you $1,000 to go deer hunt. I'd say, no. Go ahead, take somebody else. Commitment is much different. 
He kind of glossed over it like, oh, we got to be more committed to Christ. No, commitment is much different. And what's ironic about this word commitment is uh, the man who taught me about commitment is actually here today. My dad is sitting right back there. And that man, from the time as old as I can remember, he said, don't be scared of commitment. Don't be scared to commit to your life to Christ. It'll not only change you, it'll change everyone that you come into contact with. Thank you so much.